Over the many, many years of consuming more anime than humanly possible while staying locked into my room to avoid any human contact at all costs, I've come across so many wonderfully psychological and emotionally grasping shows. Darwin's Game, however, is not one of those. But what it is, is stupidly fun to watch. When you start up the show with a giant furry mascot chasing down a guy with a butcher knife and the main protagonist getting dragged into a death game by a season 2 exist best friend through the form of a mobile game, you can tell that there's not really any major philosophical plot points that you need to dig deeper to understand. But what you can do is turn off your brain and have one hell of a fun time. It definitely gives off some of the same vibes as Mira Niki when in the earlier episodes you come across a Yandere trying to save the life of her halfway wimpy bitch of a boyfriend but there is one key difference. Yeah, you guys got it. This time, the psychopathic kill-hungry girlfriend has yellow hair. Despite the fact of the extremely edgy appearance, it is still one hell of a fun time watching the slaughter fest of a storyline. While our main protagonist, Kaname, looks like a regular teenager, he's actually extremely dependable and resourceful. When he gets dragged into a last man standing wins kind of game where the only option to quit is by losing your life, Kaname adapts pretty quickly, realizing if I just stand here, the ripoff version of the Tiger and the Frosted Flakes commercial will cut my head off like the poor officer in front of me. While defeating the seemingly impossible enemies to survive after being bitten by a psychedelic hallucination in the form of a cell phone game, you start to realize this is starting to seem less like a death game and more like a superhero shounen except not with the main character starting out ridiculously overpowered because some old man thought it would be a good idea to have the entire world rest in the hands of Mr. Edgelord, even though there is some of that included. With every player receiving a sigil after being bitten by the snake, they obtain some kind of superhuman ability with things such as enhanced senses, reading the aura of everyone around you, or being able to manipulate space in order to butcher your enemies with no sense of a real weapon. Some of these sigils, however, are more battle-ready than the rest, but when it boils down to it, they can all be extremely useful. Compared to other anime in the subgenre of video games becoming real life, Darwin's game makes sure not to leave out any of the gruesomeness of every fight scene, seeing as one of the lamest characters in this whole story is the knife-wielding invisible panda man. To go up against something of that stature and survive with wits alone, you know our main protagonist has to be packing some major heat. Although the word packing doesn't really suit the situation in the case seen as our hero, Kaname has a sigil named the Hammer of the Gods, which allows him to pretty much summon any small weapon or object that he's touched before out of thin air, and seems to be one of the most versatile sigils out of the rest in the game. However, he can't produce any large weapons or electronics such as cell phones, and if he produces more than a certain number of items at a time, his stamina is almost completely depleted. All of the other players point out the fact that he could almost be a perfect assassin seeing as in any given situation, he can pull out almost any weapon out of nowhere. However, with that being said, our man Kaname doesn't even take that into consideration. Because despite having to kill or be killed, Kaname doesn't actually want to harm anyone at all, because deep down he has a good heart and is an overall good guy. A small example being that after getting used to the game and teaming up with other players, he decided he should try to help everyone out to escape this eternal mobile game of death, or find the bastard that started the whole mess. Even though this ideology in anime isn't exactly the newest, it does make his goals and aspirations easier to achieve seeing as now everyone has superhuman abilities. You remember when you were a kid, and every weekend you would watch the newest episode of whatever action cartoon you were into at the time? Darwin's game seems to bring back some of those old nostalgic vibes, with aspects like over-the-top personalities and in-tune dramatic fight scenes. Everything from the sound design to the explosive battles in this show brings out the 14-year-old action-loving teenager in me. Darwin's game seems to be extremely good at bringing out the strong character personality traits that complement their specific power. Take Shuka for example, her red frilly dress is designed to resemble a rose with her almighty death spike chains resembling the thorns, and it complements her personality as well. She's a kind-hearted and gentle person at heart, but her past has taught her not to trust anyone and to kill without hesitation. You know that Studio Nexus had to have an extremely fun time animating this show, be it with the chains flying and following Shuka's every move or literally almost any other fight in this story, and it shows that they had a blast in the anime itself with every fight being overly exciting to watch. Also note that it is kind of nice to see a show skip all of the building of the relationships and get straight to the point, because as we all can tell, this show is not a slice of life, rather the opposite. Even though it would be nice to see Shuka be less of a giver towards Kaname for the sake of fan service, and don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining about that. Her and the other members of the clan are still extremely fun to watch 
plots throughout this heroic death game. Rain, for example, is the brains of ending the death game. She's a young shut-in with her sigil named Lapless, allowing her to more or less be able to tell the future. It makes her great for information gathering. While she may seem like the slacker of the bunch, she is quite the opposite. Seeing as her sigil allows her to dodge bullets and what's the best job for somebody able to track every move around all at once? A sniper suits her better than anything else in this case. And even though she would rather avoid fighting at all costs, it's still extremely exciting to see every time it does happen. Next on the list is Sui with her sigil being able to more or less make her guitar from The Last Airbender. She could probably even make you choke on your own blood if she wasn't a total sweetheart. I wouldn't say she isn't the least violent, but most of this is due to Soda, her way more aggressive twin who's dead, with his soul being stuck inside of Sui. The last character in the honorable mentions is Ryuji. Being more or less the soldier out of the group, you can tell he has seen way too much shit for his own good. Ryuji is the one character out for revenge against the man that slaughtered his brother. His sigil allows him to be able to tell if someone is lying or being honest just by glancing at them. You can tell this game has torn away most of his compassion for others, but is slowly being brought back from interactions with Kaname. After spending more and more time with the group, Ryuji gives off this kind of big brother vibe to the others and is slowly breaking out of his shell. All in all, the show doesn't bear the deepest psychological meaning, but it is still extremely fun to watch. It's worth mentioning that this show did come out last season but wasn't talked about all that much, so I decided to shine some light on it. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button and leave a like for the sake of the algorithm. It's also nice seeing everyone's thoughts and talking about these shows with you all. So tell me in the comments if you enjoyed Darwin's Game and what your opinions are of it, even if you have yet to watch it.